Hello everyone, I am Sierra Jepson. I am a meat scientist and a lead butcher. We're gonna show you how to work up this mule deer and find some innovative cuts along the way that you might find with a conventional meat product like a beef, pork, or a lamb that you're getting from a butcher. Why can't you do that with your own game at home? Let's have fun being butchers. Let's learn something along the way. Hello everyone, I am Sierra Jepson. I am the owner, the lead butcher, and the meat scientist for Butcher Solutions, LLC. Today at Sitka headquarters, we're gonna show you how to work up this mule deer and find some innovative cuts along the way that you might find with a conventional meat product like a beef, pork, or a lamb that you're getting from a butcher. Why can't you do that with your own game at home? Let's make some fun cuts. Let's have fun being butchers. Let's learn something along the way. So now I think we're ready to talk about the tools when you are ready to start butchering and what you might want at home. I always want to have both a dirty surface as well as clean surfaces. And I wanna keep those two very, very separate. I never wanna come in and set a meat product that might be dirty on top of where I'm going to be finishing off my actual cutting and my wrapping. So contractor bags work really, really great and they're fairly cheap and you can use them as both a cut surface as well as disposable at the end. So having whatever table you might be working on, drape them with contractor bags, they're fairly thick, and then you can do all of your dirty work on this side and then once that meat is clean, you can transfer it to your clean cutting board. I typically like to lay the dirtiest side up and work that um, that meat first to make sure that I'm getting all of the big stuff, all the hair, um, dirt, mud, rocks, leaves, whatever, whatever your hunting companions might have brought home with you. So working up the dirtiest meat first face up and then transferring it to a clean surface. These cutting tops are actually just poly top tables that I've purchased from a online restaurant warehouse store and they're used for a kitchen tabletop in a prep kitchen. And so these are 20 by 30 cutting boards. It's sometimes hard to find a cutting board big enough to use in your home. And so that's why I went to a restaurant warehouse store. And then I just store them in laundry bags and tuck them away for the couple days a year that I might need them. Um, but two of these cover a typical kitchen table really, really well. I like to work with three at home. One from after I've finished working up the really dirty dirty stuff to flip it onto, and then that's still my dirty cutting top. Another one where I'm actually doing the majority of my butchering, and then a third one where I'm setting my finished cuts, and then they can be staged there until I'm ready to actually start wrapping that meat product. So when you're thinking about where in your house you're going to work up your meat products, wherever you have available, especially having a big space where you can have a little bit of elbow room is really important. It doesn't necessarily matter if that's going to be indoors or outdoors, as long as you can keep it as moderately temperate as possible. Making sure that your meat doesn't get too warm in the process of working it up is just important so that it doesn't start having any of those off flavors. It's perfectly fine to work up those meat products in your kitchen or living room or wherever you might have a big space, as long as you're working up the meat in front of you and then returning it to a cooler um, and not having too much out at one time. Um, if the weather is great outside, working up in a garage or an outdoor space is also perfectly fine to keep that meat product to a cool temperature. As we're thinking about our clean cutting surface, it's really important that number one, we're not setting dirty things on top of our clean cutting surface um, that might later become a contaminant, but also thinking about the cut surface itself. Having some kind of a poly top surface, which isn't going to harbor microbes or any other kind of pathogens is really important. These are very easy to clean. Wooden cutting boards like to absorb water. They also like to absorb bacteria. And so after a while, those wooden cutting boards have to be thrown away. So having a poly top surface makes it very easy to clean, but also make sure that you can utilize these products safely for meat. So moving on from our cut top surfaces, the next most important thing that you'll wanna have is a good knife. I definitely recommend having a boning knife, especially being a semi-flexible blade. Being semi-flexible, that means that it is going to have a little bit of give, but it'll be stiff as well, especially when you're working around bones. Having a knife that is too flexible has its purpose, but as you might be able to see, a knife that's really flexible could be difficult to work any filleting motions or to work around specific bones, and you might just have a little bit too much play. That's why I'll definitely recommend um, 
really the only tool that you will need is a boning knife. You can do everything with a boning knife. You can purchase these pretty much anywhere, um, but a six inch semi-flexible boning knife will get you really far in your home butchering career. The next knife that you might wanna have is a breaking knife or a staking knife as some places call them. So this knife here is my boning knife and it's six inches and then I have two different options, either an eight inch breaking knife or a 10 inch staking knife. The longer the knife, the smoother the cut. And so I like to use this eight inch knife for removing fat um, or any dry meat that might have um, congregated around the outside of that carcass. And then I use a staking knife to actually finish and make all of my big steak cuts or to cut roasts. You can definitely get by with just a boning knife. You can get by with a boning knife and just an eight inch breaking knife. Um, but having that big steak knife is really helpful, especially if you're working up a bigger animal like an elk or a moose. Okay, so while we're still talking about knives, we also wanna talk about the sharpening tools that you use at home and how you might be able to extend your knife life so that you're not just having a drawer full of dull knives that never really get sharpened or honed and you don't have much of a use for them anymore. I like to use a multi-oil stone in my home. Um, many folks also like to have a handheld sharpener, whatever you feel comfortable with and that you're getting a consistent angle of your edge. Um, that's really important because knives only really become sharp as you consistently hit the exact same angles on each side. So find a sharpening method that works for you and stick with it. Again, I like to go with an oil stone because it works for all of my kitchen knives. It works for my meat fabrication knives. I can even use it for my pocket knife that I use in the field. So having an oil stone that has three different coarseness levels, a coarse, a medium, and a fine works really well for my home. And then I'd like to emphasize that using some kind of a stone or a sharpening mechanism is actually what makes your knife sharp. A honing steel is actually then what polishes the edge. Many of us have these at home, but we don't use them as much as we should. If you watch any good butchering demos, you'll see those butchers using their honing steels often throughout that process. The reason is, is that as knives become dull, they start off with a really sharp edge. And we might not even realize, but even our, our smooth bladed knives here have teeth. And as those knives become dull, those teeth start to misalign. And when they're really dull, they are rolled. A rolled edge is something where you can even feel and run your thumb across that blade and it doesn't, it doesn't make an impact or you're not, you're not afraid of that knife anymore. That's a rolled edge. As knives are ran across our sharpening stone and we move from coarse to medium to fine, we're working on that edge to bring those teeth back into a raised position. And then as we move from coarse to medium to fine, they're realigning themselves. The honing steel here is that final polishing that realigns all of those teeth and gives us the final polished edge. Using a honing steel is really important because every time that you hit a bone or nick your knife off of a table, you could be creating a small little divot or a dent in those teeth, misaligning those teeth, and then basically preventing yourself from having the smoothest cut possible. Even if you can't feel that your knife is becoming dull, using a honing steel would make sure that you are prolonging the life of that edge and making sure that you don't have to come back to a sharpening stone as often. So aside from having a really good knife, the other tool I might recommend would be having a hook. Hooks are not only important as I'm working up on the dirty side and being a benefit as I'm reaching up and trimming off a piece of meat or fat that might have dirt or hair or something on it. And then coming over to our clean side and being able to use it as a butchery tool, um, maneuvering between our different seams of muscles and using it as an extra hand. Some items that you might forget about and then realize in the moment that you need would be some, some bowls off to the side that would be used for both of your trim or extra scraps of meat that you're wanting to throw away or feed to your dog um, or even something that's along the lines of stew meat. And so having some bowls stationed, cleaned, ready to go really prevents you from having to dig in your cabinets later on. Whether you wanna use your kitchen bowls or if you have something handy, like some of these lugs, these are really great. And these come in handy too when you're utilizing them for your grind later. Um, or you can pull out all the nine by 13 baking dishes that you have in your house and that works just fine. 
the final thing that you're going to want to have on hand is gloves. Gloves don't just protect you from the meat, it protects the meat from you. And so what I like to do is have a cotton glove on the bottom, and then I layer these over top with a latex glove. And this allows that my hands don't get super dirty as I'm cutting, and even if they do, it's really, really easy to remove this entire gloved system and set it off to the side. Because let's be honest, as we're working up meat, we're also answering a text um, or running outside, opening doors, whatever it might be. And so we don't want to be handling the environment around us with the same hands that we're handling our meat products with. Food safety is always important to think about. And so having that cotton glove underneath and then a latex glove over top allows me to easily remove this entire system. And then I can go back to answering that phone, opening a door, um, bringing more dirty meat onto my clean surface. And then whenever I need to remove this glove, I can switch on and put clean ones on. That also allows if I am a one woman show or one man show that's going through and cutting the meat as well as packaging it, your hands aren't you know, wet from having to wash your hands all the time um, and constantly changing out what gloves you're wearing or thinking about where your hands have been and where they are going next. These last few tips are more of a dealer's choice and they're completely up to you. But thinking about what kind of packaging material you utilize is totally up to you and your price point. Utilizing Ziploc bags are a very affordable option and simply inserting your meat product and then rolling that bag will allow as much air as possible to exit and then you can seal it off and you'll be able to receive anywhere from three to six months of really good storage just off of a Ziploc bag. Utilizing butcher paper is the next affordable option. You can buy a roll of butcher paper from your local butcher, um, and as long as it's wax lined, that meat product's gonna be perfectly safe there. And making sure that you get as much air out as possible and preventing any exposure to oxygen will allow that meat product to stay um, up, to, up to a year within butcher paper, maybe even longer. And it's actually fairly easy to thaw meat products out in butcher paper um, by, again, putting them in a Ziploc bag and submerging in water. But the final option would be utilizing a vacuum seal bag. This by far is going to give you the longest shelf life, but they are the most expensive. So depending on what your price point is, you can use anything as long as you are reducing that meat product's exposure to oxygen. Some people, um, even utilizing butcher paper, like to wrap that meat product in plastic wrap first that's perfectly fine. As long as you are getting a tight enough seal on this butcher paper and preventing any oxygen from being exposed and drying out that meat product, you're going to have a long shelf life with either of these options. These cuts that we have laid out in front of you is the entire yield off of a mule deer carcass. And so we've got our front shoulders and our hindquarters, which are our more locomotive meats. These meat products are going to yield the most and it's going to make up the bulk of what ends up in your freezer. But these are going to be some of the tougher cuts. And so we're going to do some innovative cutting today to find ways to turn more of these locomotive muscles into more steaks and fewer roasts, which end up being what a lot of people get. Down here at the other end of our table, we have our middle meat. So we have those main back straps, which are also our, our loin muscles that can become ribeyes or strip steaks in a conventional meat product. And these two muscles here are the tenderloins. These middle meats do much less work than our locomotive muscles. These muscles here are mainly to support the loin. The tenderloins actually only get worked when that animal is rearing up, which it does very rarely. And so these muscles are naturally much more tender than the locomotive muscles that have to withstand a lot of friction as those muscles are rubbing against each other, um, as they generate heat, as those animals are gallivanting across the countryside. And so these muscles will naturally be more tender instead of those locomotive muscles. Here in the middle, these are already some innovative cuts that you all may already be peeling off of your wild game, but might just be lumping them into, that's going to be trim, or that's going to be grind, or stew meat, whatever it might be. These muscles here are the muscles that come off of the shoulder that lie underneath the shoulder clod here. A lot of folks look at these and they think, okay, that's a neck roast, which you are correct. You can see where those neck bones sat. But if we think about conventionally where like the ribeye roll or the chuck roll might come off of on a beef animal, 
this is basically going to be those chuck roasts or neck roasts as you may call them and those yielded two and then down here we have the briskets briskets aren't going to come off of the the main shoulder or the round you have to be able to cut those off of the animal while it's still out in the field and so i brought those in for you today on a mule deer these were fairly thin but if you think about on a moose or an elk they're going to be a lot thicker and they might be worth saving so that's totally up to your preference if you want to keep them as briskets or cut them as stew meat but for today i wanted to show you the entire spread before we get going with our individual cuts all right, so we're going to start with our middle meats, which are comprised of those back straps as well as the tenderloins. And I would encourage folks, even when you're at home, go ahead and start with these middle meats because they do tend to be the first ones out of your animals and they are going to discolor a little bit faster than some of the other ones. These main muscles aren't going to necessarily be protected by as much fat or much, as much bone. And the tenderloin even has a tendency to discolor. And I'm not sure if you're able to see that two-toning, but because of the muscle fibers that are, comprise the tenderloin, they are very susceptible to discoloration. It doesn't mean that the meat is bad, and you can always tell if your meat is bad based off of smell. Smelling if it um, smells a little bit rancid or um, is getting a little bit of funk to it, smells always a great indication. But just because meat has slight discoloration does not mean that it is bad. Discoloration might occur due to the type of muscle fibers that you're working with. It may also occur due to whatever chilling method that you utilized. So I'm just cleaning up some of this silver skin that's here. Again, making sure that there's no hair or dirt or anything left over from when this critter was out in the field. And before this meat ever hit my cutting board, I made sure that this game was completely clean. I even put it in clean game bags as I stored it so it wasn't being stored with anything that could be pathogenic. And you can put stuff in clean game bags and keep it in your cooler for a couple of days, a couple of weeks if you'd like, as long as it's cold and it's dry, that meat's gonna be perfectly fine to age in there. Before I flip it over, I do wanna draw the attention to some of these side muscles. So this main loin muscle is called the longissimus dorsi, and that's the main loin muscle that makes up our ribeye steaks. These little side muscles here, these are also really, really tender. This muscle here is called the spinalis. That's my favorite muscle in the whole carcass. So these loin muscles are really the only cuts that we're going to have that have multiple muscles in them today. Everything else is going to be single muscles. Making sure that you're working with single muscles ensures that there's no connective tissue in between. And so you're gonna have a more tender eating experience. But up in these main loin muscles and along this back strap here, those secondary muscles, as we call them, are actually very tender in and of themselves. And so it's okay to have those accompany these back strap steaks. That's what actually distinguishes a ribeye from your strip loin steaks. And so we're gonna leave those there because they're really tasty and they're really tender. So as we're thinking about keeping the carcass really, really clean when you're out in the field, keeping in mind having the carcass laid down in front of you and peeling back the hide from one side and exposing all of the muscles underneath is a really good way to keep everything clean because then you're able to see all of the muscle groups underneath. The back straps are completely exposed and you're able just to peel those out of there. And then once that animal is completely worked up on that one side, you can flip that carcass over and then peel back the hide on that side, again, exposing all of those muscle groups. So you might have a little bit of hair or dirt on one side of those muscle groups that you're gonna have to trim away, but the underside is completely clean. What I do in the field is I'll also have gloves with me, gloves that I use to actually hunt with that are there for warmth. And then I'll bring another pair of lightweight cotton gloves that are there specifically for once that hide is removed. And I'll put those on to only handle once that hide is removed, I'm working with clean gloves. So as we're looking at these main backstrap stakes that are here in front of us, I'm going to go ahead and pull out one of my staking knives. Um, here, I'm just gonna use that eight inch breaking knife. You can also have something larger like a 10 inch, um, whatever, whatever floats your boat, but the larger the knife, the smoother the cut. That is true and factual. And so I'm going to start with the actual ribeye portion. Again, the ribeye portion 
is going to be where all these secondary muscles are. Wherever those muscles end, that be then becomes where your strip loin stakes would come from. These can all be called backstrap stakes, but I do want to point out that the reason that they are called ribeyes is because of those extra secondary muscles. This main loin muscle starts really, really narrow up here at the front of the animal. It becomes wider, it takes over from where all those other small muscles disappear, and then it takes over throughout the rest of the loin until it tapers off back in the sirloin. So I went ahead and I just made this first cut where, where it kind of dives off and those little main muscles had taken over. These muscles are really great for kebab meat. Don't put them into your stew pile. They're so tender. They deserve to be on the ribeye. It's not their fault that they took over where the ribeye was at. And so these little muscles I'm going to save off to the side with any other trimming, and that becomes kebab meat. Again, it doesn't need to be um, you know, slow cooked or roasted. It can be its own standalone steak. They're just a little bit too small to be their own steaks. So I'm gonna go through here and make steaks about inch and a quarter, inch and a half. Nice thick ribeye steaks. And I'm using a method where you push forward and then you pull back. That finishes your cut in basically two strokes. Rather than sawing at, these, at the meat, if you have a sharp knife, you should be able to push through it, pull back, and finish that cut. So right about where that spinalis ends. Again, that spinalis is the side muscle. Really, really delicious and tasty. It's what gives that ribeye that circular, that crescent muscle off to the side. So that's what your ribeye steaks would look like in a mule deer. Back here towards the end of this main loin muscle, I can continue this exact same motion working down all the way through. These certainly call them backstrap steaks. These would then become your, your strip loin steaks if it were in a conventional domestic livestock species. It's the exact same loin muscle, it's just further back. And this muscle does become a little bit more tough, anterior to posterior. That's why your ribeye steaks are a little bit more tender than what those strip loins might be. And I'm gonna go through and continue to cut those inch and a quarter, inch and a half steaks all the way down. This muscle that I ended off here, this is not a full steak, and so I'm going to go ahead and insert that back into that kebab pile. 15 steaks out of one side off of a mule deer, which is a really good yield. Off of this other backstrap, I can do the exact same thing, ending me with 30 backstrap steaks, which is pretty fantastic. If I'm a person where I want something that I can roast, or maybe I don't want to grill individual steaks, what you can do is separate this main loin out into four, six, eight inch sections, wrap that entire thing, and then you can grill that whole later. Or you can butterfly it open, roll it, stuff it, um, which I've done, it's really delicious, and you know, the meat is your oyster. You can do whatever you want with it. It's your meat, you killed it. So on this side, what I'll go ahead and do is I will separate these those four, six, eight inch pieces. And then later these can be roasted and sliced. So as we're thinking about where our rib meats and our middle meats come from, a lot of folks are interested in as many bone-in items as they can have. Bone-in steaks are really wonderful, especially when they're coming from um, the arm and the legs and making osobuco and um, other different kinds of bone-in steaks. Is it worth it to keep those ribs connected as we're thinking about our middle meats? As a meat scientist, I say probably not. Especially as we think about chronic wasting disease in wild game, that is a neurological disorder. Neurological meaning that spinal cord is a potential area where those prions or those rogue proteins could be harboring. So where spinal cord is connected would be the thoracic vertebrae um, up towards our ribs. And so leaving any of that spinal material connected could be a potential hazard for CWD. I haven't done the research or the science on it, but why expose ourselves to anything unnecessary if we don't have to? Um, and so making sure that that, um, that spinal cord and any of those areas where CWD could harbor, go ahead and just leave that thoracic vertebrae connected to the carcass, leave that in the field. I'll go ahead and I'll finish off making this kebab meat. And again, I'm gonna keep that separate. And I won't necessarily wrap up this package quite yet because I might have some sirloin tips or something along the way that I want to throw into kebab meat rather than stew. 
any of those tender muscle cuts that don't deserve being thrown in the crock pot that can be standalone, I like leaving them as kebabs. You might notice as I'm working up trim today, I'm going to be removing as much fat as possible. Fat is flavor. And so in our game meat, it's just as true as for our domestic species. And so we want to remove as much as that fat and gristle as we can. And any pieces like these, we can either leave whole or we can throw it into our grind. And we're just gonna make ourselves a little grind section over here off to the side. So today I'm gonna to be throwing anything that is not grind worthy into this metal lug and then anything that's lean into a grind pile. Most of our at-home grinders do not have an offshoot where it's going to kick out gristle and bone and fat and cartilage and anything extra. And so we wanna make sure that what's going into our grind pile is as lean as possible. Wild game, the fat is very high in polyunsaturated fats, which does lend itself to oxidative flavors, which is off flavoring. And so making sure that that fat stays really cold is important, but as that fat might start to warm up, that's where off flavors are coming from. So keeping our trim as lean as possible, and then also making sure that our meat is cold as we're working it up will help prevent any off flavors from occurring while we're actually processing the game. So as we're thinking about the fat being flavor for these critters, this was a pretty chunky mule deer. And so you might be able to see that there's actually even some marbling that is present within this meat product. Marbling being the little flecks of flavor that are within the actual muscle. Marbling is really beneficial in aiding in a tenderness illusion. Um, they allow um, that meat product to be lubricated when we chew it. Those little pockets of fat actually melt down, creating a less dense product. Um, so marbling is really wonderful in creating a tender factor as we're consuming meats. As we're trimming down the rest of our game though, it is fairly important to go ahead and trim off all the subcutaneous or that external fat. Um, that fat does aid in giving game its flavor, but it's not necessary for any of the tenderness factors. So um, if you are interested in a really gamey, robust flavor, that external fat will get you there. But if you're looking for game that tastes like game, but isn't necessarily overpowering, go ahead and trim off as much of that external fat as you can. You'll still be left with plenty of that intramuscular fat that will provide game flavor, but not an overpowering that might turn some folks away. So we're gonna transition now. The last of our middle meats here would be our tenderloins. So as you're pulling these off the carcass, keep in mind this is the most, the most, the most tender muscle in the entire carcass. Um, we as humans, we love to rank things. As meat scientists, we don't, <laughs> just because depending on how you cook a meat item, um, you could influence the tenderness depending on how you cook it or how the animal is harvested, the age of the animal, whatever it might be. But time and time again, the tenderloin continues to rise to the top as the most tender muscle in the entire carcass. Again, the animal only uses this muscle when it's rearing up. Otherwise, it is just there to support the loin does discolor fairly quickly, so don't let this muscle just sit at the bottom of your game bag for several, several days. Go ahead and get that puppy out of there, get it worked up, and take a look here. You can see that there are two muscles. This one here is the psoas major. This little guy is the psoas minor. These two muscles, they are both part of the tenderloin. This psoas minor often will get pulled off if you're not super careful or even aware that it's there. It's okay if you leave him behind, but if you remember to take them with you and you're very careful, this makes a great addition to that kebab pile. Great, so these are your middle meats. These are the meats that will be the most tender on your entire carcass. I encourage you to start here um, as these are the most tender, but they also will lend themselves to a little bit of discoloration. So work up these really tasty steaks you're gonna be left with a really great product that you will be happy grilling. So let's talk about the front shoulders from some of our game animals. Front shoulders are a locomotive area of these animals. They are using their front shoulders to move. And so naturally they are where some of our tougher muscles can come from, but also some really tender steaks. So we're gonna break down how to work through this mule deer shoulder. And I do wanna point out as we get started here, 
any little areas of bloodshot that could have come from a capillary rupture, um, perhaps if you had any residual blood from that kill, we're gonna go ahead and trim that away. This is where our meat hooks really come in handy. Because any areas of blood are definitely an area that we could have some microbial growth harboring itself. Um, blood is very high in water activity, um, and so we do wanna make sure that we trim that away. Something important to remember is that blood is left at the harvest site and we don't necessarily bring any blood with us when we're butchers. And so if you ever see red liquid at the bottom of your packages or on your table, it's not blood. That's actually myoglobin. Myoglobin is just a protein mixture of water and that myoglobin protein. Myoglobin is the oxygen binding, iron containing component in meat. That is why meat is red. And so it's binding oxygen within muscle fibers, not in the blood. And so that myoglobin is not blood. It's very safe to give to your dogs. Um, and it's just something simply that you want to wipe away, um, but not necessarily something that you need to be afraid of. So as I start off with the shoulder, I wanna point out that I'm starting with the side that was facing my animal. I'm starting with that side up towards me. This side was external on the outside of the animal. So I'm gonna start with that side down. This is just my personal preference, but there are a couple really tender stakes that I wanna draw your attention to and make sure that we don't miss them. So starting off here on the bottom of my scapula, so the scapula is right here, this muscle, subscapularis, under scapula. This muscle becomes the vagus strip stake. The reason you may not recognize that name is that this muscle was attempted to have a patent put on it, not the muscle itself, but the cutting technique. It never actually went through, but it is a tasty little muscle that's very, very thin, easy to remove. You're not gonna feed your whole family with it, but on a larger animal such as an elk or a moose, it's a great addition to your flat iron steak packs um, or any of those other just single muscles that you might have that you know that they're really nice little minute steaks, flash in the pan, they're gonna be really tasty. They're gonna make great additions. So make sure that you remove that Vegas strip steak first and that it doesn't just get lost in your grind pile. Smaller animals, save it off to the side and then you'll be able to package both sides together. The next muscle I want to draw your attention to sat right next to it. This is the teres major. This is the only muscle in the entire carcass, the only muscle that goes by its scientific name. The reason is this little muscle here, the teres major, its common name is the shoulder tender. The muscle all the way off on the other side, its common name is the chuck tender. His names sound very similar. They're very easy to mix up. This muscle, very tender. This muscle, not at all. So the teres major here set right next to our subscapularis, that biggest strip stake. It's kind of torpedo shaped. So I'm just gonna start at the top, expose one of the ends, and I'm just gonna peel it out of here. Underneath sits the triceps. It's got a lot of heavy connective tissue. So I'm just going to nick away at this seam and peel this muscle out. And if I accidentally go a little bit too deep, it's okay. That teres major is a pretty resilient muscle. It's not quite as tender as our tenderloin, so you can give it a little bit of a tug and it'll come out with you. And the triceps that sits underneath it, because it has that silver skin, it's protected a little bit. So I'm just gonna peel this muscle out. And that's going to be its own little standalone steak as well. Again, I'll mention, we are working up a mule deer today. So not the biggest, not the smallest animal, but not the biggest either. And so these muscles are only going to become even larger as you're working up elk and moose. And so they're going to become even more of standalone steak. So if they are worth peeling off on a mule deer, they're definitely worth saving on some of your bigger animals. So there's that Terrace Major, a really good standalone steak and worth saving. The muscles that sat right next to it here, these are additional muscles called your lats. Some of you might go to the gym and work out on your lats. It's a really flat muscle. You can see where the muscle fibers are running against it. Really good muscle for jerky. So we can go through here. This was a fat 
fat mule deer, we opted to leave a lot of that fat on the carcass as we were packing it out, which was a lot of extra weight, but having fat on as you're chilling these carcasses does help to retain moisture in those meat products and keeps it from drying out. So although it was a little bit of extra work, it was worth it in the end. Just gonna trim these guys up. So next we're gonna work up this chuck tender that's here on the opposite side of our Vegas strip steak. This muscle sits right next to our scapula. So the scapula, you can feel the bone. I know you can't feel it, but I can. So we can feel this bone and it just nestles right in here. And this muscle is not tender. Although it is called the chuck tender, it's not a tender muscle. And so I am going to be careful as I cut it out simply because working along seams is always easier. It's always easier to find where these muscles are at, where they're going, not accidentally cut into something tender if you're following natural seams. So I encourage everybody to do that. But also because I'm going to turn this into stew meat. I have attempted to roast the mock tender as an actual roast. It's like, okay, it's not tender. It shouldn't be a steak because we have big pieces of connective tissue that run right through the middle of it. So we don't want this muscle to be a steak because no matter how you cut it, you're always gonna have that connective tissue in the middle. But I have even tried to roast it. That connective tissue doesn't roast out. No matter how low and slow, it's always going to be there. And so the mock tender is a muscle that is excellent for your stew meat or for your grind. So those are the three big steaks that I wanted to get off of this side of the shoulder. So the Vegas strip steak, the Terrace Major, and then that mock tender. Whether or not you decided to keep it as a steak or roast or turn it into a stew meat like what I did. The last thing I'll do before I flip over is just take any other muscles that I might want for my grind pile and just trim those up. And as I'm trimming up this scapula preparing my grind pile. Smaller, leaner size pieces are more manageable for your grinders, just because we don't want to overpower them. Again, we want to keep this meat as cold as possible, especially when we're working up our grind and keeping our fat cold as well. And so if we can make it easier on our grinder, our grinders won't overheat. It'll keep that meat colder. And overall, then you're going to have a more mild tasting product. So the last thing I'll do before I completely flip over, this little muscle right here is the biceps. If we can imagine as our animals are walking, they use a lot more of their tricep as they're walking than they do their bicep. This muscle, full of a lot of connective tissue, it's always gonna be grind. There's not much you really want to salvage off of it. And it'll just peel right off of there. You don't need to spend a lot of time going through each of these individual seams trying to get all that connective tissue out of there. It's primarily composed of connective tissue. So go ahead and just let your grinder do the work on that one. What I'm gonna do here or what I already have done is my triceps muscle is right here. I went ahead and just made a straight cut right along the side of my scapula there. And then my scapula connects in right up top here. So I'm just gonna loosen all of these little muscles so that when I flip it over, All I have remaining is a scapula. Nice flat joint there that separated my scapula from the rest of the arm. Flip that guy over. My arm. This little muscle down here is just extra. I'm gonna trim that away. That'll go into our trim pile. Okay, so what we have remaining here is the scapula. There's nothing on the other side except this one muscle. This muscle sits on top of the scapula, more towards the external part of the animal. You could imagine that this side was facing out. So this muscle is what becomes our flat iron. It is not yet a flat iron. Right now it is the top blade. So we're gonna go ahead and remove this top blade because it sits on top of the blade. There's a spine of the scapula that sits right here. So what I'm gonna do is take my knife and trace along that spine keeping as close to it as I can. I'm even gonna angle in towards that spine. It's really big and rigid. I'm gonna cut all the way down to it. And then I'm gonna let my hook do the work. This is where this hook really comes in handy. 
If you don't choose to have a hook at home, you can do this with your knife. But as I scrape, I'm peeling this muscle away from the bone. Again, we as humans really like to rank muscles. The tenderloin is the most tender muscle in the entire carcass. That is fact. This muscle here, the infraspinatus, is the second most tender muscle in the entire carcass. Again, that is fact. All of the other muscles in these carcasses can jockey positions and get mixed up depending on the age of the animal and how it's cooked and um, all these other influence, influential processes. This muscle, time and time again, has proven to be the second most tender muscle in the entire carcass. And it sits in a very locomotive part of the animal, which is wild. This muscle, it's just protected by that scapula. It doesn't do a lot of work. And it's also protected by a big piece of connective tissue that runs right down the middle of it. So there's our clean scapula. We can work, again, in that little ridge Clean up a little bit of meat. But other than that, it's a pretty clean scapula. So again, this will become a flat iron. It's not a flat iron yet. What we need to keep in mind is that although it's the most tender muscle, excuse me, second most tender muscle, can't forget the tenderloin, there is a really big tendon that runs right between it. So if I were to go through and cut steaks like this, you get top blade steaks. Not the best use of this muscle because you're going to have that big tendon that runs the entire length of this muscle all the way down. This muscle is proven to be more tough and more resistant to heat than the big tendon that runs up the back of these animals' necks. That holds that entire antler, um, the entire head. This tendon is more tough than that tendon in the back of the neck. So we wanna make sure we get it out of here. So this piece, I'm just going to trim off these pieces of lean, use that in my grind. The rest, I'm gonna make sure I can cut into flat iron steaks. With our flat iron steaks, the easiest way to cheat this muscle so that you can easily cut is to expose the tendon on both sides. So here I can see where that tendon's gonna run. On one side, and where the tendon is gonna run on the other side is kind of hidden. So I'm gonna grab one of my staking knives here, give it a steal. Steal your knives as much as you need to throughout your cutting process, it'll keep them sharp. And I'm just gonna take a small sliver off the side here, which exposes where that tendon is at and I can use it as a guiding point. On a bigger animal such as an elk or a moose, this tendon will likely be centered and you're gonna be able to get decent sized flat irons off of both sides. Here, because I have cheated and I can see where that tendon runs, I see the bottom stake is gonna be much thicker than the top. The top today, because it's a small mule deer, is probably going to be a sacrificial versus that bottom is what I'm gonna save for my flat irons. And because I do get this muscle on both sides, it's okay I'm not gonna be able to flay it out and save that top. I get another four quarter, and so I'll save those stakes and package those ones together. Best way to fillet out this flat iron, set your stake perpendicular to yourself, position your knife over top of that really tough connective tissue so that it's a protective barrier against that really tender muscle that's underneath it. And then I'm going to just kind of use that tendon on the side that I've exposed as a guideline and just fillet it all the way down. Because I'm pressing against that really tough connective tissue, I'm not gonna score into the really, really tender muscle that's underneath it. And then, again, you wanna get that tough connective tissue out. So I'm gonna then slide my knife underneath it, and now I'm gonna push up against it. Again, protecting these really, really tender infraspinatus muscles, second most tender in the carcass, so they do tear easily. So I'm always going to be pushing against that tough tendon, so I protect the tender muscles. That tendon, 
it's not really worth putting in your grind. It's just not going to work out very nice. So there we go. So there on this side, we have our two flat iron stakes now. In a larger animal, um, these are traditionally cut into either halves or thirds. For a smaller deer, I'm going to leave them whole and intact. That, again, makes a really nice minute steak. And I'll just package those two together. The last stakeable item that we're going to peel off here is your triceps. The triceps can also be referred to as the arm roast. It's a big triangular shaped muscle. Right now I'm just tracing right underneath this ulna or the elbow. And on the other side, I'm finding that humerus bone, funniest bone in the body. And I'm tracing right along that. And I'm just gonna separate this off from the rest of our bones here. So large triangular shaped muscle here separate from the rest. No matter what you decide to do with the triceps, if you're going to roast it as an arm roast, or I'm going to show you how to stake it out as ranch steaks, you always want to go ahead and just remove the silver skin. My best method for removing silver skin is start on one end, get as close to that silver skin as you can, push all the way through underneath it, and then finish the cut. As long as you are pushing in one direction, you're not really going to mess up the muscle fibers underneath. So with the triceps here, again, you have the option to leave it together as an arm roast. You can even cut it in half if you'd like a smaller roast off a bigger animal. What I'd like to show you how to do is to create ranch steaks. Ranch steaks come from a very tough muscle but have the opportunity to be tender if you remove all of the other additional muscles. It's the triceps, so there are three different heads to this muscle. What you always want to do to make something more tender is to remove any additional muscles and get down to a single muscle cut. So what I'm going to do is just start finding seams. Here's a seam over here. Those two muscles were connected by seams. I can tell that this right here is a muscle that sits on top of a bigger muscle. And so by working down through seams, you are just finding the biggest muscle that remains for this triceps. And that remaining muscle is going to be the one that we cut our ranch steaks out of. In terms of yield, this isn't the best way to get the most yield out of this muscle. The most yield would be leaving it as an arm roast. But if we are out to find the most grillable cuts off of our wild game, this is a great opportunity to find what could be a roast, but also can be a really great steak opportunity. So these little muscles that I peeled off here, again, anything can be grind, anything can be jerky, anything can be stew meat. And so I'm going to take the option to turn those into stew meat because I already have the mock tender out of this shoulder, which are fairly tough muscle cuts. And so I'm going to combine these little pieces in with those mock tender stew meat bits. And I just know that those are going to require a little bit more time and attention. Definitely want to keep your stew meat to no more than one square inch, um, making sure that they're bite-sized pieces. Meat doesn't really shrink up that much in a crock pot, and so make sure that they are manageable sizes, especially considering that this meat isn't the most tough to, or excuse me, isn't the most tender to start with, and then you're going to be putting it through a slow cooking process. You want to give your eating experience the most help that it can get. And those I'm just gonna allow to be grind. Which leaves me with the most important piece then, the biggest head out of the triceps that has three heads onto it, and I'm going to turn this into ranch steaks. So I'm gonna flip my muscle to the side here. Find which direction your grain is running. Always cut against the grain. So if our grains are running in this direction, I want to cut against them, meaning that I am shortening those muscle fibers, cutting down the effort that it takes to chew this muscle, cutting these into about an inch, inch and a quarter, and I am left with ranch steaks. 
really tasty, awesome off of our bigger animals, but even these small animals, they're gonna make really, really wonderful small steak medallions, a good opportunity for a breakfast steak. We need protein in every meal, a great option for our shoulders. And now I'm going to finish off with the shanks. So our shanks are a good opportunity for grinds, but again, if we're looking for more opportunities for something other than just grind, I love grind, but if there's something else we can do with it, let's do it. For this one, I'm going to present the opportunity for boneless shanks. For those to be boneless, all I have to do is just find this seam where it connects in with the bone, and I'm just gonna peel it away. When we hear the word osobuco, that does refer to shanks, but osobuco, osobuco simply refers to meat that has a bone in it and is cross-cut. So as I'm removing these shanks, they're no longer also buco, they are boneless shanks, which makes a great chance for us to cut them in half and have a good braising option for you. Okay, So a lot of connective tissue that runs through these shanks here, but if you slow cook them enough with enough moisture, enough heat for long enough, that connective tissue will break down and they become very, very tender. So boneless shanks. Cool. And that's that. We can go ahead and find any of these additional muscles that are still hanging out, trim them off of our bones here. If you want to keep bones for soups, you definitely can crack this humerus away from the radius and save those in any manner that you choose. So as we think about our front shoulder, we think locomotive. These muscles certainly have the opportunity to be awesome in our grind or jerky or stew meat, but our front shoulder also comprises a lot of individual muscles that are really, really tender and can stand alone as their own steaks. If you do take the time to find these individual muscle cuts, you can have yourself a really great grilling experience at home. So here we have a mule deer hindquarter and our hindquarters are very traditional for their large muscle groups that are not known for their tenderness. Today I'm going to show you how to find some really innovative cuts as well as some of our more traditional steaks and roasts so that you can have a great grilling or roasting experience with your wild game at home. So the first thing that we wanted to notice is that this hindquarter still has the sirloin connected to it. When you are field dressing your wild game, go ahead and try to include as much as this sirloin as possible. If you could imagine that this animal was still connected to the rest of the loin, this sirloin just dives a little bit closer and connects in with where our back straps are sitting. That hip bone angles in, and so you are going to have to be very careful about where you go to hit this um, H bone here and separate off our sirloin. But if you do so, you're gonna leave a lot of this sirloin connected and you're going to be able to get a lot of really tasty steaks. Try not to leave the sirloin behind back in the field. The first cut that I'm going to make though, might seem a little counterintuitive, but I'm just going to make a straight cut. Right off the end of this H bone, I'm going to make a straight cut, separating the sirloin from the rest of our round. The remaining portion here is our sirloin cut. This was a very fat mule deer, and so I will go ahead and trim away just a little bit of this fat. And by a little bit, I mean a lot. <laughs> so working through our sirloin portions here, we see that there are three big muscles that really rise to the top. So down here is our biceps femoris. This muscle is our sirloin cap. Um, when it's in its full form, this can be the pecania or the culotte. So on a larger animal, this is a mule deer, but on an elk or a moose, your whole pecania could be kept together and roasted or sliced um, or smoked. And today we're gonna go ahead and just cut steaks out of that top sirloin cap. That top sirloin cap is most tender from the front of the animal and gets more tough towards the back. That is actually the same muscle that becomes our bottom round, that we're gonna get bottom round steaks um, and roasts out of. And so it's a great muscle towards the front of the animal. It gets more tough the farther back it goes. So we're gonna go ahead and peel off that top sterling cap. Larger animal, you can leave it whole. Today, we're gonna slice that. 
The next main muscle that we notice here is the main muscle of our sirloin. This is the gluteus medius. So there's small muscles on top, which in a bigger animal, I would encourage you save. And that small little muscle can be called the sirloin tender. Today, it's not large enough for me to save, and so that'll go into my grind pile. But if you do ever find a small muscle sitting on top, go ahead and take off the silver skin, call it the sirloin tender, and put it on your grill. It is amazing. The remaining portion here, that gluteus medius, is the main muscle in our sirloin. These main muscles can be further divided just by following a seam. If you flip over, it's not, I'm not gonna cut back here, but we can use this seam as a guiding light to show us where we do want to cut. You can notice that this sirloin does have a main seam that runs through it. If I wanted to, I could go through and just cut big sirloin steaks, and that's perfectly acceptable, but I do have to keep in mind that one side of those steaks is going to have a tougher eating experience than the other, just because of that connective tissue. So on our larger animals, we'll be able to notice that there's a big seam that runs through here. Big sirloin will be able to roll out this smaller section, have baseball sirloins set aside from our top sirloin steaks, which are on the other side. All right, so now that we have our sirloin muscles, so our top sirloin cap, and then our center cut sirloin steaks here, all cleaned up, we're ready to cut steaks. So here, always find which direction your grains are going. I can see that they're running in this direction, so I'm going to cut across those grains. Sirloin cap steak. Sirloin cap steak. This small portion, you might remember that I encourage anybody to keep tender cuts of meat from the, the middle meats. Keep them set aside as kebab meat or something that doesn't necessarily need put in the crock pot but isn't um, poor enough to go into trim. So I'm going to save these portions, cut them as kebabs, and combine them with my ribeye kebab meat. If you have a large enough animal, such as an elk or a moose, you can even save these portions and specifically label them as sirloin kebabs. Now it's time to cut my center cut sirloins. Again, I'm going to find where my muscle fibers run, which looks like they're running more vertically. And so I will then stake this direction. Let's turn her, go ahead and take a couple ends off, put that into my kebab meat pile, and we're ready to cut those steaks. Nice little mule deer sirloin steaks. Moving on to our main hindquarter here, we have a couple big muscle subgroups that we're going to find, and we always want to be following our seams. Following seams in the hindquarter is really essential to making sure that you're getting the right muscles, and then you're also going to be able to break it apart a lot easier. It's really tempting to just dive right in, but following those seams, I promise you, will make your life a lot easier. Over here on this side is your quadricep, very similar to your own. The quadricep is called the sirloin tip. Even though it's called the sirloin, it is still connected to our round. It's still a fairly locomotive part of the animal. So those steaks aren't quite as tender as the sirloin cuts we just presented. So our sirloin tip, our inside round or the top round because it's sitting on top. The bottom round is the group of muscles that'll sit on the bottom. Then we also have the eye of round that sits on this side and then we will have our heel. So the first cut I'm going to make is finding where my top round sits and then where the knuckle sits. Knuckle is another word for that sirloin tip. There's a seam that sits right through here. So I'm just going to find where these two muscles separate. So here I can see where the top round sits. Here I can sit where the knuckle is. Starting up at that ball joint, just gonna start working my way through seams. And when I say seams, all of these muscle bundles are surrounded by connective tissue. And so by separating and working around muscle bundles, I'm not cutting lean, I'm cutting that fat tissue that's around them. And it provides a really nice guiding light for where I want to go. So as I'm working down through this seam, I can see seams meaning that there's a lot of connective tissue in there. 
this sirloin tip sits right along the femur bone. So that seam opened up for me and now I'm able to trace along that femur. And I'm just gonna start rolling this out. Quadricep, knuckle, sirloin tip are all synonyms for this muscle group that I'm peeling out. Because it's the quadricep, there are four different muscles that comprise it. Those four muscles, as you can imagine, your own quadricep kind of sit in a football shape or circle. And so that makes this muscle group really easy to roll out. So that is our sirloin tip, our knuckle, our quadricep. Okay, you can see that here's the muscle that we separated from our bone. We're just gonna take that muscle off and then we'll be able to separate the rest of this into either steaks or sirloin tip roasts. We'll come back to that guy. The next thing that we can do is take off of our inside round or the top round. Again, top because it's sitting up. We put the external surface of the animal on the outside here. I always like to start with the cleanest side facing up as I'm working up these animals. Oh, what did I just pull off? That's the tri-tip. <laughs> so right now I'm just cleaning off our tri-tip. Our tri-tip, where this sits, so if we can imagine that our sirloin tip was still connected. On the other side, our tri-tip is actually part of the bottom sirloin. That's the subprimal it belongs to. So it is the middleman between our top sirloin, which sat right here, and then our tri-tip that sat on the bottom. Tri-tip likes to overlap and kind of protect that ball tip there, and there'll just be a little portion of it that overlaps with the tip. Because I rolled this out, it was kind of just remaining on the top sirloin. And so you can either take off your tri-tip first or second, either way. But it decided to come second today. So what I'll do here is remove some of this fat. All right, so we've removed our quadricep, our ball tip, the sirloin tip, any of those synonyms. Next thing we'll do is we'll take off our inside round or the top round. So what we'll do here is we'll start working from the other side of that femur bone, again, finding some seams. And what you can notice up here is that this muscle, it stops. And that's a good indication of where we wanna start digging our knife because that is the top of that muscle. And it's not very deep, okay? You might notice it's actually fairly thin. And so it starts off pretty thin and I can kind of turn my knife and just trace alongside of it, and then it really dives down, and I'm just gonna follow that muscle. Small little thumb-shaped one that's more or less sacrificial. And I'm just gonna start peeling back this top round. Working along these seams, working down. This whole thing's just gonna peel right out of here. Again, finding seams and working along them will be your best friend because then that helps you identify what muscle groups you're looking at. It's hard to know which muscles are great for steaks, which ones are roasts, if they're all just one big jumble of muscles. All right, so peeling this guy out, this is again our top round. So this muscle that sits on top, it's called the gracilis, the top round cap. And it's really, really thin. Today it's protected by a bit of fat. That top round cap is actually a pretty good grilling steak. You can treat it just like a flank or a skirt steak. It's going to be pretty thin and you're always going to want to remove this muscle unless unless you keep the top round as a roast then you can you can leave that muscle on there. But if you're going to cut your top round into steaks which are nice lean thick steaks a little bit more tough because they're locomotive you will want to remove this top round cap anyway. Again, because single muscle groups make great steaks. So that gracilis, that top round cap, makes a really good marinating option. Marinating, and then you can notice the muscle fibers are very obvious to see, very similar to a flank steak or a skirt steak. I'm gonna cut off some of those blood vessels there. Any blood vessels that remain are going to be very obvious here in this hind quarter. Just because it's a very vascular part of the animal, we have that big femoral artery that runs right through here. 
So we do want to be careful to cut out any of those large connective tissues, large pockets of fat that could have blood vessels that harbor in there. Um, blood vessels have the opportunity to still have some blood in them if um, we didn't have the best bleeding out out in the field. And so you want to remove any of those blood vessels for the, for the fact that there could be blood in there. Also, these large pockets of fat protect these blood vessels and they also have large lymph glands in them. Lymph glands help filter out bacteria or infection in the animals and so they're definitely not something that we would like to have included in our lean grind. And so we wanna make sure that we're cutting out those big pockets of fat. We don't need to go exploring in there too, too deeply. All right, so here we have our top round, our top round cap, sirloin tip. Next thing we're gonna do is take off this eye of round. The eye of round, in my opinion, is the worst muscle in the entire carcass, worst being the least tender. It's not really even just my opinion. It is scientific that this muscle is two-toned, meaning that it has more white fibers than red muscle fibers. This eye of round is the hamstring of the animal. So you can imagine it does a lot of work for our wild game. These animals do use it a lot. It's very, very tough. The hamstring, this eye of round, has elastin in it. Elastin is the most tough connective tissue contained in our animal. The eye of round, the hamstring, if you've ever heard of somebody needing ACL surgery in the human world, we actually can take a bicep of the eye of round and use it to repair the ACL, if that gives you an indication of just how tough this muscle is. So if we take a cross section here, you might be able to see the re reflectivity of some of those muscle bundles. So within here, there is elastin woven around, a lot of white muscle fibers, which are great for explosive energy use not necessarily long distance running. So very muscular muscle, but not one that you wanna use for steaks. Very deceiving, very deceiving that we would want to just go ahead and cut nice little steaks out of it. You certainly could, but you're going to experience there a tough, tough eating experience. This muscle can be used as a roast and it shreds apart really nicely, strictly because those muscle fibers are really, really long. Um, so. Cut it as a steak at your own risk. I certainly don't recommend that. Leaving it as a roast, okay. However, I think it makes a really, really great muscle for your stew meat, for your jerky, for your grind. So now that we have effectively removed our eye of round from the table, we're gonna dive into the bottom round here. So top round sat right on top of it. And I can just lift up this femur bone here, flip her around. It's just gonna peel right off. Carefully working around my heel, which sits right here. Also wanna be careful of this shank down here because that shank is where I removed the hoof and they're pretty tough to clean. And so sometimes there could be some residual dirt or hair. So just being careful of where you throw the shank at. Don't want it to just be thrown, well, thrown around willy nilly. Take off any good trim that might still be on this bottom round. making sure that all the fat we clean up off the top. In this bottom round, we have a really, really big seam of silver skin that sits across the front here. It's really, really tough. So I'm gonna slide my knife underneath it and then just push all the way, atop, all the way across, finish the cut on the other side. That silver skin does not cook down very well at all. So definitely encourage the complete removal. The other side as well. Great. Flip it over, world's fattest mule deer. Get rid of some of that fat. It is more tender at the front of this muscle and then progressively becomes more tough the farther we cut back. So. As we are thinking about cutting this muscle into steaks, or if you are seeking some steaks and some roasts, this thicker portion is the best for your steaks. 
And then as we go back, this might be the better portion for a roast or for your jerky meat. I'm gonna flip it over here. I'm also gonna peel off this little side muscle because again, the more muscles we have, the more connective tissue present, the more likely that we could have a tough eating experience. So we just want to minimize any of that risk. So we've got our bottom round, our top round, and our sirloin tip. I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna cut some bottom round steaks. Here we go. Because I've got these big muscle groups, I'm gonna use my big knife because I can and I want to. All right, so bottom round steaks, here we go. I'm gonna go about an inch in thickness because these are locomotive cuts. They are a little bit tougher, and so I don't necessarily need them to be inch and a quarter, inch and a half. So here we go. So there are bottom round steaks. These steaks closer towards that front of the animal are gonna be more tender versus the ones closer towards the back. If so there are our bottom round steaks. Those could have been left alone and left as a bottom round roast, just cut it in half and you're, you're done. Um, anything from the bottom round or the top round can absolutely become jerky as well. Um, it's, it's a really great portion of the animal. It's really, really lean. Um, and the muscle fibers make it a great option for your jerkies. So what I'm doing here with the top round, see there's a little bit more fat here we wanna remove. This top round is shaped kind of like a heart, as you can, if you can kind of imagine that. Um, it's got some rounded edges here. And there's this muscle off here to the side. That is the adductor muscle. Adductor means it takes away. If you wanted to have London broils, so before I take that muscle off, if you wanted London broils or top round roasts, top round roast, simply cut this guy in half and you've got a top round roast. Well done. If you'd like London broils, London broil literally just means large lean piece of meat. You can have London broil out of the bottom round, the top round, the sirloin, whatever you want. But London broils are anywhere from an inch to three to four inches in thickness. Um, typically a two inch top round roast works really nice um, because then you can marinate it and you can still slow grill it um, or smoke it or something along those lines. If you're gonna have a London broil, just go through here um, and make nice big two inch sections out of the, the main center cut of that top round. Just square it up and then cut two inch portions and you've got London broils. So working with this top round here, so this adductor muscle, because I am a gal, that I want as many steak items, as many grillable items as I can get. So I'm gonna remove this adductor muscle. This adductor can become the San Antonio steaks. So I'm gonna square it up here Square it up. And then these San Antonio steaks are as simple as slicing little one inchers. This muscle does tend to be a little bit more tough. And so if you know that you've had a critter that maybe, maybe ran a little bit farther or might have been rutting pretty hard, it's okay for this muscle to end up in your jerky or in your grind. Today, I can feel that it's actually a pretty tender muscle. And you can actually, you, you're able to feel the tenderness and. Um, give yourself an estimation of how tender your steaks might be. Um, so I can feel it's gonna be actually a pretty tender eating experience. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut some San Antonio steaks out of these guys. So it looks like I've got four nice steaks. These two little ones got a little bit small on me. So stew meat it is. If you're not a stew meat person, more grind, more jerky. Any of these um, small steaks, once it's a steak, you can still cut it into a jerky slice. That's actually the best way to cut jerky but I've got four nice little San Antonio steaks. I'm gonna set off that can be grillable items. Now this top round, it's a big muscle and it does become tricky for us to cool these large muscles, especially as they are closer to the bone. So closer to the bone tends to harbor some heat. And so if you ever notice some discoloration off towards the side, that's okay. It could have just been some heat harboring close to that bone. It is important to, you know, if you're concerned about maybe some sour bone or something funky happening, use a sniff test. If something smells sour, go ahead and trim it away. It's not going to cook out. So if it smells sour here, there's probably some spoilage happening. It's okay just to throw out that meat. It will impact the flavor of your grind. So anything sour, it's probably just because there was some heat held up against that bone. It's not impacting the rest of the meat, just that one specific portion. All right, so today, I'm gonna just trim up the rest of this guy and now I'm gonna cut some top round steaks. 
grab my big knife because I've got a big piece of meat. Bigger the knife, the smoother the cut. Square her up. And off we go. Top rounds can become top round roasts if you cut them in half. Top round steaks. Or they can become jerky. This is a really great muscle for jerky because as you might be able to notice, the muscle fibers are really, really obvious in the direction that they're running. And so, as I'm cutting these steaks, again, about an inch in thickness, I'm gonna take this guy off the end here. And we'll take this nice one in the middle. So any steak can become jerky. So cut your steaks and then flip it to its side. Now that it's on its side, take a knife, angle it down, and slice thin portions of jerky. This way you save yourself the hassle of trying to strip individual pieces, make them consistent, figure out which way the grains are going. This way, these grains are always going to peel apart after that jerky is formulated. You can see how that's gonna be really, really nice jerky. It's thin sliced. It's gonna be easy to chew. So you can tell when you slice this jerky, the slice is going to be consistent. And then after you're done drying it, you can see how easy that's going to be to tear apart and to chew. So, as you're making your jerky slices, any muscle can be jerky. Cut it like a normal steak, flip that steak to the side, and then slice it. You're gonna have really thin slices, they're gonna be fairly consistent, and that muscle fiber is going to make it really, really easy to chew and tear apart. All right, so wrapping up with our quadricept here, what I'm gonna do is actually flip it over. In our sirloin tip, the quadricep, there are four muscles that comprise, so I'm going to Come through here and remove this small little one. This was the muscle that was holding the whole quadricep back to our femur. So that little guy is always going to be grind. Even if you want this muscle as roast, go ahead and still just take off that little guy. Okay. And that'll go into our grind pile. And then I'm going to trim up some of this fat. So that's not connected. Alrighty, and then finally this little side muscle as well. Just naturally wanted to peel off of there. We can cut that one into stew. I think I've got enough stew meat, so I'm gonna make that into a grind. Alrighty. So now out of, I had four muscles to start with, now I've really only got two. Um, if you've got that third muscle over here, if it's, you know, nice and football shaped and hanging on there, leave it on there. It's not bothering anybody. And that can definitely be a part of um, really nice um, of these sirloin tip steaks or roasts. For a sirloin tip roast, the only thing you really need to do here is cut this in half. Or if you've got a moose or an elk or something big, cut it in thirds. And then those big, nice slabs um, could be sirloin tip roasts. A half could be a sirloin tip roast. For a smaller critter, such as a mule deer, this entire thing could be a sirloin tip roast. Um, sirloin tips actually make a really nice Christmas roast um, or something something for a holiday. It's, it's a muscle that, um, it is located in the hindquarter. However, it has the opportunity and the flavor capacity to be a center of the plate or a celebration meal. So you can season this really, really well roast it like you would a prime rib, and these muscles are actually gonna turn out really great because they have the steak ability as well as the roasting ability that we're all looking for in a really great meat product. So as a roast, here it is, done. Cut it in half, cut it in thirds, whatever you want. But if you want more grillable items, we can do that for you. Simply flip it over again. And this main circular muscle here is the tough one, meaning that the one that's off to the side is really tender. So I'm just gonna push away at this main center muscle, which is the rectus femoris. 
femoris being close to the femur. Okay, so I'm just pushing away the side muscle, vastus lateralis. And so then I'm left with the center portion, which is more so the tough piece that's part of our quadricep, and then the side muscle, which is much more tender. And this is going to be a great steak option. All right, so what we are left here is our sirloin tip steakable opportunities. So this is the muscle that was off of the side. This is the best steak out of the sirloin tip. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut those inch, inch and a quarter sirloin tip steaks. Those are really great for grilling. This sirloin tip center portion as you can see, does have a piece of connective tissue that runs through the middle of it. And so that is the part that doesn't make it awesome for a steak or makes it a little bit less awesome than the side portion. So you can leave, after you've already cut off your side portion here, you can leave the sirloin tip center roast as a roast. And that's what I'm gonna do today. Go ahead, if you'd like more steakable items, feel free to cut these as steaks, but keep in mind that there is that piece of connective tissue that's going to prevent it from being immensely tender. So you can leave it as I did as a roast. If you have a big animal, like a moose or an elk, you even have the opportunity to cut these as steaks and then cut that piece of connective tissue out. You're the butcher, you get to do whatever you want. Um, commercially, it's a little bit too much work for butchers to do that. So you won't um, ever have that opportunity commercially. But if you're the butcher, if you find a piece of connective tissue through the middle of a steak, just cut that piece out and you can have a nice little medallion. But for today, I'll cut that end portion into stew meat. And then I'm going to have myself sirloin tip steaks and a sirloin tip center roast. Which leaves me with one final thing on the hindquarter which is the heel. So the heel is basically the calf of this animal. The muscle is called the gastrocnemius, and we are going to receive a steak called the Merlot steak. Yes, Merlot as in the wine. And this is one of the most common cuts that ends up in the grinder that has the great potential to be a very tender steak. And so we're gonna salvage it today and show you how to find this, this cut. So I'm simply finding those seams and just peeled that heel right off. Now, the rest that's left on here is still destined to be a shank cut. Also buco if you choose to leave the bone in and you can just make cross cut sections here with a bone saw. Later, I'm going to make boneless shanks out of this and just peel that right off. But in the meantime, I can set aside the rest of that portion, leave me to my work with the heel. Now the heel, is kind of round on both sides and then flat in the middle. This big piece of, of muscle that runs up through the middle here is where really all of the connective tissue lies. In the industry, this is called the banana shank. And these are sold primarily overseas as an export for countries that really, really enjoy slow roasting with a lot of liquid. And so I have some banana shanks saved in my freezer and you can save them as well if you would like another braisable item. And you can even lump these in with all of your other boneless shanks. But keep in mind there is a lot of connective tissue here. If you aren't interested in braising or cooking with moisture or anything in the crock pot, you can go ahead and just dice this up and put it into your grind. Don't take the time, don't even bother to try to get all that connective tissue out because there is a lot. It's a very tough little muscle. So you can simply just cross cut it and put that into your grind. Grinders will typically eat up that silver skin pretty, pretty well. Especially if the rest of your grind is pretty lean, you're not gonna notice that little amount. Now I have these two little muscles that can just be separated. And there's a nice little seam here. Just gonna work along it, separate these two apart. And these now create Merlot steaks. One Merlot steak does come out to be better than the other. This one has this little bit of a ridge, and so that makes it tough to be this flat, really grillable item. You can cut off that ridge, or since we have two sides, I'll probably turn this one into the Merlot steak. This one might just go into grind, and then I'll get two 
really nice Merlot steaks. Again, this one can be as well, but it's not as nice, as big, as flat um, as this original that I peeled off. So there it is, the Merlot steak. The first time I heard about this option was from a butcher, and I was really shocked to see. I was like, what's the Merlot steak? I've never heard of that. It's like, well, it comes from the shank. It's like, okay, come on. Surely no grillable item comes from the shank of the animal, the calf muscle. He says, yeah, take it home, you can grill it. And so I did, and it was wonderful. And so I am a believer in the Merlot steak. And I hope that you are one too. So just cleaning up that silver skin. And since I've already separated off that other muscle, there's really not any other connective tissue in here. And so it truly is just a large grillable piece of meat. Then that leaves us with our Merlot steak. Again, bigger animals, they're gonna be even bigger, but already that's a pretty good size portion. And if we get two per animal, four if you really wanna get adventurous with these little side guys, then it's actually a pretty decent steak option for you versus more grind. All right, so now we're just gonna wrap up with our shank. If you are interested in bone-in product, this is a great opportunity to make asabuco. Asabuco literally just means on the bone. So to have osso you need to have a bone contained. So you could take a, a small hand saw or a meat saw and just make little one, one and a half, two inch portions. Um, you might be able to get two or three out of a mule deer, probably two out of an elk or a moose, maybe three per side. Um, you can do this with the hind quarter. You can also do it with the front shanks as well. The front shanks actually are even the better portion of shank. They're a little bit meatier. For me, I don't love working with a bone saw at home, and so I would prefer to have boneless shanks. And so that's what I'll show you here. You don't need to have a hand saw to be really successful. You can really do it all with your boning knife. So I'm just gonna work around this bone on both sides, and we're just gonna strip it off of here. And it's really, it's hard to imagine how well these shanks actually cook down. But take it from somebody who just had boneless shanks a couple weeks ago. If you add enough moisture and that heat is low and slow enough, all of this connective tissue does break down and it creates a really tender product. So there is a boneless shank and I can finish that cut by just cutting it in half. And those will go into a crock pot or an Instapot. And they make really nice boneless shanks that as long as they're braised, they'll be really tender. There you have it. This is the hindquarter. Again, a very locomotive part of our wild game animals, which can create some very tender opportunities. Leave them as roasts, cut them as steaks. The choice is truly yours. However, I hope that this video shows you that the options are much more endless than simply hindquarter steak. Thank you so much for tuning in today as we've explored a couple different ways that we can break down your wild game. From the forequarter to the hindquarter and everything in between, it's truly up to you on what you want your cuts to look like once they're in the freezer. But we hope that you've taken away a couple innovative ways so you can maximize your wild game at home.